Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. I am once again joined by Yoshua Browers. So he is an archaeologist and an editor at Ancient World Magazine. And whereas previously we'd explored the Minoans in Crete, now we're going to be looking at the Mycenaeans over at the Argolis, and that's where we're going to be looking at here. So just to give you brief context, we'll look at the map where we're located. So this is going to be southwest of Athens in the region of Argolis. Uh, and there's going to be a couple major kind of remnants of the Mycenaean civilization in the form of these major citadels. Uh, we're mostly going to be focusing on Mycenae up here, uh, but also for the brief intro, we're going to give you some context on some of the region, the civilization, and some of the interesting features present. Uh, so, Yasha, I'll let you take it away then. So, the ancient Greeks of the classical era believed that there had been an earlier uh, so-called Age of Heroes, and during this period, humans were thought to have been much closer to the gods, and humans were believed to have been, you know, bigger and stronger than during the historical period. And um, some of them were even thought to be the offspring of gods and mortals, like the hero Perseus and his mighty grandson Heracles. And during this time, two major wars were fought. One for control of Thebes, later immortalized as the Seven against Thebes, and a generation later, the war against Troy, which I think most people will be familiar with. And the ancient Greeks believed that the heroes of this age had really existed and that the Theban and Trojan war, wars had actually happened. Um, this is why, for example, uh, the classical Greek writers Herodotus and Thucydides both start their histories with a discussion of the Trojan War. In the modern era, uh, very few people believe that the Trojan War had actually happened. Uh, the general history of ancient Greece was focused mostly on the first millennium BC and the, uh, the classical period in particular, so let's say the, uh, the 5th and the 4th centuries BC, and a few centuries leading up to that, uh, the Hellenistic period after that, and then the Roman era. And scholarly opinion uh, in general was that, for example, Homer's Iliad, the, the famous epic poem that is set during the final year of the Trojan War, was just a fantasy. And evidence that perhaps some form of advanced culture had existed that predated the classical era, because every once in a while people would, you know, find uh, tombs with stuff in there, uh, was often interpreted as intrusive or foreign or something. You know, it was was Phoenician or it was something else. So it was generally not acknowledged to have been actually a product of the uh, of Greece itself. So in the 19th century, this view sort of started to change. Um, things came to a head when the German businessman. Um, Heinrich Schliemann set out for Turkey with the express aim of proving the historicity of the Trojan War. If you if you read his own personal accounts, uh, you, you imagine him standing there with a copy of the Iliad in one hand and a shovel in the other. It's, it's probably slightly <laughs> it's a bit of hyperbole. Uh, hyperbole. Um, so, but anyway, he was he set out and he wanted to show that the that there was a, a historical kernel of truth behind the, the tales of the Trojan War. And he was convinced in Turkey by an, uh, by an Englishman, Frank Calvert, to start digging at a site known as Hisarlik in 1871. And the rest, I think, is, is fairly familiar history. Uh, Schliemann discovered an important settlement at this location, protected by mighty walls, uh, that is almost universally agreed to be the city famous from Homer's epic poem and the other Greek tales surrounding the Trojan War. It's been identified as the city of Troy. Now, at one point, Schliemann had to get out of uh, Turkey. I won't go into the details, but um, there was some deception on his part that made the, uh, uh, the, the Turkish authorities uh, deny him further permission to excavate at, uh, at Troy. So he went to the Greek mainland uh, with the goal of verifying uh, that uh, the uh, Greek elements of the, uh, of the story of the Trojan War were also correct. So he started digging um, at the capital city of the Greek leader of the expedition against Troy, uh, whose name was Agamemnon, and the city in question was Mycenae. And Mycenae, uh, also what you will see in the game, uh, it's a citadel, it's located on a, on a rocky um, hill, basically, uh, protected by large, thick walls, uh, constructed mostly out of so-called Cyclopean masonry, we'll talk about that later, I think. Um, and it has been described by, uh, um, for example, a travel writer, Pausanias, in uh, antiquity. Um, and they thought that the walls had been built by the, the Cyclopes, so one-eyed giants, uh, because the, the boulders that made up, make up the uh, Cyclopean walls are so huge they couldn't imagine actual mortals being able to lift those. 
Um, and hence those walls were always there. So the ancient Greeks attributed this to the Age of Heroes. And so when Schliemann started digging there, he realized that, you know, if this isn't classical Greek, it must be early, it must be older. And he started excavating there. And he first started in uh, what we now refer to as Grave Circle A, which we'll see in the game as well. And he found a, a number of shaft graves here with incredibly rich finds. Uh, weapons, uh, valuable objects, including gold, uh, gold sheath uh, death masks, of which uh, one was proclaimed by Schliemann as the Mask of Agamemnon, even though these finds all date from the 17th to 16th centuries BC, so they're uh, far too old um, uh, for that, because the, the Trojan War, if it ever really happened, the general consensus is that it would have happened around 1200 BC, let's say, maybe 1250 BC, and so this is centuries older than that. Um, nevertheless, with these discoveries and with everything else that he unearthed in uh, at Mycenae and slightly later also at Tyrans, he demonstrated that before the Classical Era there had been, in the second millennium BC, a flourishing civilization. And as a result, the culture of the Late Bronze Age on the Greek mainland, on the Greek southern and, and part of the central mainland, is referred to as Mycenaean. So let's say it, it covers the, the pottery phases, Late Atlantic 1 down to Late Atlantic uh, 3, including Sub-Mycenaean, and it's referred to as the Mycenaean uh, era in general, so 1700 BC to about 1100, uh, 1050 BC. Awesome. And uh, a lot of the remaining archaeological finds are centered around the Argolis, uh, is that correct? Well, the Argolis was uh, a key region in, in among the, uh, the, the Mycenaean archaeological culture. Uh, the most impressive finds, the most impressive citadels are found here in the Argolis, mainly uh, there, there were three, uh, Mycenae, uh, Tyrans, and one that isn't in the game as far as I know, which is Medea. Uh, all three of them have an association with Perseus in later classical history. Um, we don't exactly know what the relationship is between these different citadels. Was Mycenae the dominant one? Uh, that has been suggested with perhaps Tyrants as a harbor city. On the other hand, the fact that all three of these citadels are heavily fortified and that the territory can be reasonably divided in, in three parts uh, also suggests that perhaps uh, they were all independent kingdoms or maybe at different points of in history they dominated each other. Um, there are other Mycenaean citadels as well in other parts of uh, the Peloponnese and central Greece uh, all the way up to the south of uh, Thessaly, at Dimini and, and Yorkos for example. Um, Boeotia is the only other region that is really comparable to uh, the Argolid as far as the, the richness of the finds and the, the monumentality of the, uh, the architecture is concerned so probably the Argolid and Boeotia were the two most powerful regions in uh, Greece during the late Bronze Age. And the idea is also that these cities were able to project power uh, across the um, Aegean, so across the Aegean Islands, and maybe all the way to Asia Minor. We know that the Hittites at one point, the Hittite king writes letters to a certain great king of Ahiyawa, and Ahiyawa sounds very similar to Achaeans, which is one of the Homeric words for uh, Greeks, a general term for Greeks, in other words, also Danaans and Argives. Argives are more strictly the inhabitants of the Argolid, so it sort of suggests also the, the influence that Argolis had in the history of Greece. Uh, and the Ahiyawa, if they existed, they were probably probably Mycenae, maybe a Boeotian city like Thebes, um, with their uh, territories across the, the Aegean stuff within their sphere of influence if they didn't dominate it outright. So there's a lot we don't know exactly about the political um, uh, organization in the late Bronze Age. Uh, for example, in the previous video, we also talked about Knossos and how it may have been overtaken by, you know, Mycenaeans in parentheses in in in, uh, in uh, quotation marks, because you know what we refer to as Minoans and Mycenaeans. That's archaeological labels. It doesn't really mean that they were peoples as such. Um, we don't know exactly how the Mycenaeans and Minoans identified themselves. We don't know what names they used. So we don't know if My Mycenaeans and Minoans, as we refer to them, uh, regarded themselves as ethnically distinct. So there's all sorts of problems here, but um, the uh, it, it's what makes it interesting also at the same time. Yeah, thanks for that kind of high-level context. Uh, I was thinking maybe we could use uh, this quick flyover to discuss mm -hmm. some of the characteristics that uh, kind of define these citadels. 
uh, that oh, yeah. remain before we do the actual walkthrough of Mycenae and get into the, the specifics. So maybe here, oh, yeah, sure. like I said, just the general characteristics of these these ancient citadels. Yeah, yeah. well, this is Tyrant, which is uh, built on this uh, rocky outcrop, this little island in the Argive uh, uh, plain, basically. Um, so it's uh, rocky, and they build these massive walls on top of them. These are the so-called Cyclopean fortifications. In the game, the, the the texture makes it seem like the like these are, are all ashlar blocks, so you know rectangular work blocks. But Cyclopean masonry really consists of these large boulders um, that are stacked on top of one another. It's usually uh, a double shell with rubble in between. Uh, spaces in between these large boulders are filled up with uh, little rocks. But here it, it looks like you know you have these these big rectangular ashlar blocks, which is not completely correct. Um, they also have these um, these uh, parapets with these battlements, for example. Um, we're not exactly sure if they had uh, this sort of stuff on top of the walls. There, there's a fresco, the so-called siege fresco, um, and also other pictures from the Mycenaean era where it seems like uh, it was just flat at the top. So you had a wall, but didn't actually have like the... Uh, like this, this covered parapet, like this, these battle ones along the sides. Uh, it's just it was open, so they were more like these open uh, fighting platforms where people would stand on and then throw rocks and spears and shoot um, uh, arrows at the enemies or whatever. So it, it's yeah, not exactly clear whether they they had the this kind of stuff on top. Um, here you can see the, the, the banners that, that are also depicted, by the way, that you see this all over the game. Uh, they're completely ahistorical. This is something straight out of uh, a Third Reich movie or something. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the ancient Greeks, so that's... Uh, no. Here you can see a bit the, the tall structure in the center there is supposed to be the, uh, the palace of uh, Tyrans. All of these citadels, these Mycenaean citadels, they, they're focused if you remember the Minoan palaces from the uh, the previous video, they tend not to have a real focus aside from the the central court. Um, there is no one structure that seems dominant. But with the Mycenaeans, you have a, a court, uh, and behind there is a uh, like here. There is a, a palace structure, Megaron uh, in uh, plan, which consists of a more or less square room with a hearth with four pillars around it usually, it's the, the classical form uh, of the Mycenaean Megaron. And there's an anteroom uh, that allows access to this to the central room, it's usually included, and in front of the anteroom is a, uh, a porch with uh, two columns. So and that's a very, uh, that's a structure you also see in the later classical Greek uh, temples. It's the internal structure of a temple as well. So there's an interesting connection here between, let's say, rulers and, and, and sacred places that uh, you might be able to draw a line there through uh, through, oh, through the course of, of Greek history as such. And then the, the last thing there perhaps to mention is, okay, we've touched on the walls, we've touched on kind of the centerpiece of the insides, but uh, I think you'd been telling me also there were, you know, structures on the outside, lower cities, exterior cities, things of the like. Yeah, exactly. The focus is always on these on these citadels because they're so prominent and they're archaeologically super visible, of course. But they're all of these citadels. They're they're basically the heart of a of a large uh, town or city, basically. So you should imagine that there's also houses uh, on on one or all of the sides of the of the citadel. I think it's on one side. Um, and another thing, maybe to point out in, in the case of Tyrans, Tyrans is the uh, the only Mycenaean citadel that's really close to the sea. It's the one closest to the sea. And um, the uh, landscape changed dramatically because the, um, the distance from the, the citadel to the coast today uh, is about double what it was in the Bronze Age. So that's one of the things, if you look also at the archaeological stuff that they've excavated in Tyrans, there's loads of, of imports and, and, and things. So we know that Tyrans was an important uh, uh, exchange hub uh, with the rest of the world and um, if you look at the site now and you see how far it is from the sea it might be a bit difficult to imagine but it's from the early bronze age onwards the, the land has continuously increased the coast has moved further and further away um, in the game it's a bit difficult to see because all the distances are so uh, so compressed so, but it's uh, if you're actually there on, at the site it's very noticeable and the change in landscape also um, Mycenae at one point is evidence that they 
have concerns for water and that sort of stuff. And um, there is evidence that over the course of the Late Bronze Age, the area there became drier and drier and agriculture became more and more difficult, which sort of explains why the the, the balance of power in the Argolids shifted from these Mycenaean citadels uh, to, in the historical period, the city of Argos, which you see there as a giant sprawl in the game. Um, Yeah, exactly there. Um, Argos in the uh, first millennium BC becomes this uh, powerful center because the the climate has changed there, the the local climate, to make the Argive plain there much more uh, fertile and useful than uh, than Mycenae or uh, the surrounds of Mycenae and Tyrians. Well, great. Thanks for that context. And uh, we're going to continue to zoom in on the specifics. So I think now at this point, we're ready to go and visit the actual uh, fortress or citadel of uh, Mycenae. So uh, mm-hmm. let's go ahead and uh, walk the walk. Yeah. And as we cross off, the, the developers have completely ignored the classical history of the, uh, the site because uh, Mycenae was actually occupied uh, fairly quickly uh, after the Mycenaean palace uh, was destroyed um, around 1200 BC. There were loads of troubles all through the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, all of the Mycenaean palaces were destroyed by uh, by fire. Uh, but Mycenae was quickly reoccupied and um, during the Archaic and Classical period it was actually a thriving town here until Argos exerted its influence and um, captured and destroyed the city in 468 BC. So there should be remains of classical houses here but they're not because the, the developers model it after the, um, the archaeological site. So this is the famous Lion Gate, um, and you can see it's a well-defended uh, area. This was built around 1250 BC. They added that bastion-like structure to the right. So this is basically like a little box you have to get into if you want to break through the uh, the, the gate there. You have to imagine uh, two wooden doors uh, at the gate and um, with uh, people, if you, if you wanted to to get access there, people would be standing here on the walls on three sides and they would be throwing rocks and, and javelins and shooting arrows and whatever and uh, try to prevent you from uh, from breaking through. And uh, I guess as you were talking about the flat, flat battlements, this might be a representation of it? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So it was probably, probably there were no, no battlements as such, so no, uh, no crenellations, I should say. Um, the crenellations that they've added, I think it's supposed to be mud brick. It could be, uh, but I don't think there's any any proof that they were really there. Um, so no no crenellated walls, probably, uh, but it's one with a bit of a caveat. You can see here that the uh, the gate consists of basically these two massive stones with this lintel on top, and in order to make to to relieve the uh, the lintel, they added this uh, this triangular. Uh, section which is basically uh, to to force the stresses of the wall out along the uh, the side uh, the posts of the, the gate if you will um, and the relief is interesting in the game because they've uh, turned the lionesses that are there they've turned them into male lions for reasons that I don't really know because um, they've given them very prominent manes but the actual relief the lions don't have these very prominent manes maybe they were painted on or something but it's, they look more like lionesses and they're flanking this um, Minoan style uh, column that the Mycenaeans also use. The significance of this is not entirely clear. The The faces of the lions also uh, have been lost. They were probably made from a different material, uh, maybe bronze. I think that's sort of the suggestion in the game as well. Um, they're flanking this uh, this uh, pillar. It's been suggested that maybe that the pillar represents uh, a, a principal goddess or something, and the the lions lion um, iconography is fairly common among uh, the Mycenaeans, especially in Mycenae itself. And it's been suggested that maybe they were emblems of the the royal family here. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, let's. Uh... Go ahead. Because unlike uh, the case with the with the Minoans, we actually have um, writing from the Mycenaean world, uh, Linear B, that we can read. And it's an early form of Greek, and we know a little bit of the social structure. And at the very top was a man referred to as the Wanax, which is very similar to later Greek Annex, which is also how Homer refers to Agamemnon, for example, which is basically uh, Lord. Uh, it's also used as deities at some point. Um, and it's the the king of uh, of 
what we assume are all these independent uh, Mycenaean kingdoms. And there was a, a lower ranking uh, guy referred to as the Lavagetas, which on etymological grounds was probably an army leader. And there was a nobility referred to as the Hecatai, um, which we know from the Linear B tablets, they were given uh, linen. You're now walking up the uh, the main ramp, by the way, as it's referred to, which ultimately leads to the palace. To the right are the, uh, is the grave circle um, A that uh, Heinrich Schliemann excavated. Um, so the Hecatai, which were given uh, linen and wheels, and they also used chariots and stuff, and then there were craftsmen, and there were, of course, loads of farmers. Everybody in, in the ancient world, most of the people in the ancient world, 80-90% of the population would have been farmers, basically. So here, uh, in front of you, you see the uh, the palace. It looks a little weird this way because they they didn't include any of the uh, the other structures that were actually there around it, and they again have these massive stairs in front of it, which um, there really should be just an open court in front of the uh, the palace instead of the, the stairs. But you know, the Megaron structure is more or less uh, preserved. So you have this porch with the two uh, columns there. And behind the porch is an anteroom, and the anteroom leads to the uh, to the actual Megaron itself, which may have served as a uh, as a throne room. So these pillars, by the way, are interesting. They're modeled after the uh, the columns. Um, yeah, the decoration on them is modeled after the columns from the treasury of Atreus that we will look at uh, later, even though the game looks completely different. So they have some uh, frescoes here that are uh, not the ones that were found in this particular area. Those shields are very typical for the Bronze Age. And they have the Minoan fresco, it looks like. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the similar frescoes were also used by the uh, by the Mycenaeans. Uh, the uh, the top one is the, the bull leaping fresco from Mycenaeus. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but um, <laughs> we know that the Mycenaeans also use bull leaping uh, frescoes. Uh, they may even oh, okay. have Minoan uh, um, artists to come and, uh, and and add those to the palace. The, the shields that you see there, they're so-called figure eight shields. Um, they were made from perishable materials, uh, just, you know, a wooden frame with cow skin, uh, you know, stretch over them. And um, they're very common in art. We also find them loads of miniature ones that were used uh, on, on necklaces or bracelets and that sort of stuff, like jewelry. Um, but they were probably no longer really in use in this period. The evidence for the use of shields, especially for the 13th century BC, is uh, uh, almost non-existent. So it's very interesting that they have these decorative elements. Shields do reappear in the 12th century, by the way, so after the collapse of the Mycenaean palaces. So what you walked through was the anteroom, and now we're in the main room here, where the, the developers have added this sort of Ark of the Covenant-like thing in the, in the center there. The, uh, these four pillars here, uh, there would have been a large circular hearth, uh, hearth um, large circular hearth in between, uh, so a low uh, circular platform, let's say, when there was a big fire. And on the other side of the room, where there's the cage, uh, the far, far wall, there's also a little platform that would probably have been the place where the, the throne was. And the question is sort of, you know, did, was it used by the king or was this uh, something else? But considering the, the central location of the Megaron and the importance attached to this particular space, this is probably where the king sat and where he would have received visitors and uh, that sort of stuff. Interesting. And uh, again, yeah. another example of these multi-storied buildings with the central area to bring in the light. Um, yeah. Yeah, the the Megaron had at least another had at least an, an upper story. We don't know exactly if maybe there was a third story as well. I don't think so, but it, well, it could be. And was the intent in this structure just to do kind of official duties, or was it actually a place to like a, just a large house for the king and the and the royal family? Uh, well, that's the the, the question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, pr probably it was a combination of, of public and private functions. You also see that, or the suggestion of that, also in the Minoan palaces, where there's a combination of public and private stuff. There are loads of um, houses uh, on the the citadel, also uh, houses and workshops. So the the difference between public and private was maybe not so uh, not so strict in some some uh, instances. I see. Yeah, let's uh, continue to poke around this structure. Uh, is, there, is there anything else notable within this uh, central structure, or should we move on? 
and I think we can move on. I think those, those slabs on the floor are uh, better than, than what we saw in uh, in uh, no Knossos, sauce. but they're still, uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure that they have these like this, but so okay. this is all because it's used as, as some sort of uh, fort or whatever in the game. So you have all these uh, warriors walking around and that looks like it. No. Looks like they're playing a game. <laughs> they could be playing dice with a popular pastime for uh, in the classical period. So where to next? So if you go back down the main ramp to the uh, to Grave Circle A, because here you can you can sort of get an impression of the uh, the structure of the the citadel. You see the remains of the houses and. Um, to the left there, for example. Um, again, as with the with the Minoan architecture, you should imagine like uh, a stone base for the walls, uh, maybe uh, partially stone for the first uh, story, and then uh, probably mud brick superstructures. Um, not for the fortifications, because those were entirely made of stone. There are some instances where it's stone sockles with mud brick, but not here. Um, no, exactly. So and they they repeat a lot of the same textures. So you see that fresco with the uh, with the procession with the women there. You see them everywhere, <laughs> which uh, you know, in reality every fresco was unique, of course. So they uh, it was all you know, handmade. So you wouldn't have this repetition like you have in the game, which is you know it's understandable that they did it, of course, because you know you can't really be expected to hire thirty artists. Just to make Bronze Age frescoes for uh, <laughs> for something yeah. that most players will just run past without looking. Anyway, so this is uh, Grave Circle A. This is uh, uh, interesting. This is where Schliemann first started digging, where he uncovered six shaft graves, which are basically these um, deep well, shafts um, where they buried multiple people, uh, probably families or lineages. Um, here it, it's very rocky, and there's like this sort of tomb-like thing at the bottom. This, this is not at all what, what it's like uh, in, in real life, but um, this is where the, the major finds came from, like the, the uh, Mask of Agamemnon and that sort of stuff. And there's this uh, round wall around it that you can also see that they've recreated in the game, uh, which yeah. consists of all these upright slabs, which also these uh, top by these other slabs, and there's an entrance pointing towards the, the Lion Gate, as you can see right there. And this was added later, um, and it sort of marked the place as special. And originally, the fortifications also ran uh, in such a way that the grave circle was outside of the fortifications. And around 1250 BC, they did a big remodeling of the of the site, and they incorporated grave circle A within the walls. So it's clear that the grave circle was considered uh, important for the people who lived here. Yeah, and, and it looks like even... you can you can see that here. This is the old wall, I assume. Uh, no, it's, yeah, maybe they sort of incorporated it as the old wall, uh, yeah, sort of, and then they added the, the new wall there, there's a tower there, but it's, that should actually be a Hellenistic tower, if I, if I read it correctly, because there should have been a gate there in the Bronze Age, but it was uh, demolished when they added a, uh, uh, a tower in the Hellenistic period, I think that's sort of what it's supposed to be. Understood. Okay, so very important area, and would this yeah, have yeah. been a communal burial, or just for the uh, the leading families? No, this was for the leading families. These the the tombs here were very very rich. So these were for uh, high ranking elite members of the 17th and 16th centuries BC, more or less. Let's say um, it's it's the end of Middle Helladic and the beginning uh, of Late Helladic, so Late Helladic one. Um, if if you're keeping up with the ceramic phases, let's say. <laughs> Um, yeah, this this is this is fantasy from the game. This is like the inside of Tholos' uh, uh, tomb, which we will see later. Also, uh, there's nothing like this underneath Mycenae. Um, so, this is just for game purposes. Okay. Well, uh, in that case, let's go to the uh, the one that is more real and uh, that inspired these uh, these elements. Yeah. 
And like I said, a lot of the site, a lot of the Mycenaean remains were still visible in the um, in the historical period. So also in the when Mycenae was still a town in archaic and classic and, and early classical Greece at least before Argos uh, destroyed it and expelled all the inhabitants. Um, the people here also venerated the Grave Circle A as the home uh, of, or as the burial place of uh, famous heroes, because there is a. Now, if I recall correctly, a pottery fragment that was found here inscribed for the hero. It's in um, Elizabeth French's book on Mycenae uh, somewhere. Um, so that it was the, the center of a hero cult, most likely. So people who lived here believed that there was heroes that were heroes that were buried there as well. Maybe Agamemnon or whatever. So Schliemann's idea wasn't that far from how the ancient Greeks may have conceived of that uh, particular place. So what's the association between the main burial kind of pit that we just visited and then the one that we're going to be looking at here in the hill? Uh, well, the, the Grave Circle A is much older, uh, and the one that they've located here in the hill, this is supposed to be the treasury of Atreus, as it's referred to, because when it was first discovered, they believed it was a, a treasury rather than a tomb, but it's actually a very good example of a so-called uh, Tholos uh, tomb which um, is sort of similar to chamber tombs uh, that they also use, except that chamber tombs are cut into the rock. And you have like this long, narrow uh, passageway, the, the dromos, which is a road basically, at least to the central chamber. Sometimes there are other chambers attached to that, where they bury uh, uh, multiple people over the course of time. And um, the treasury of Atreus is a, a Tholos tomb, and um, Tholoi are built in soft hills. They dig them out, basically. Uh, they work from top to bottom, they reach the bedrock, they even the floor, and then they start building in concentric circles. Uh, what you can see here in ashlar blocks, so, uh, you know, well-dressed uh, masonry, um, these, uh, these walls that they build up to the top, and every layer is more and more narrow, so you get this corbelled effect. And the real treasury of Atreus, which looks nothing like this, um, I mean, the basic structure is okay, but the real treasury of Atreus has this long, impressive dromos with ashlar masonry that leads to this massive door, a massive entranceway where originally there were two double wooden doors that were sheathed in bronze and flanked by uh, uh, marble uh, half columns, and also a relieving element in the... Uh, uh, above the door, just like at the Lion Gate, except this was probably just with abstract um, uh, motifs decorated. The, the triangular thing is now gone, by the way. And then you would lead, then you would get into this central chamber, and uh, at the Treasury of Atreus, which is the uh, which is the biggest, I think, it's 14 and a half meters in diameter, and it's 13.6 meters in height, and it's the biggest um, domed uh, or corbelled. Uh, space for the next 1,000 years. It, it's it's only overshadowed in the Roman era uh, when uh, the Pantheon is built in Rome, essentially. Um, so you have the central chamber where uh, they would put people uh, that had died with loads of offerings. Uh, sometimes there was a side uh, room as well, a side chamber that they added, like you can see here also in the game. Um, where they would also bury people, or they would just, you know, you would put them on the ground with all of their stuff, the paraphernalia, you would imagine that they were also, you know, finely dressed, and uh, they have pottery and artifacts, etc. Um, these uh, Tholos tombs, they were always uh, uh, reburied, um, so, you know, you would have, it would be a hill with the dromos leading towards these massive doors, and along the top they would build uh, from what we understand at least, a uh, circular wall, short circular wall, um, where uh, there would be sort of a central place where people could bring offerings to the deceased, etc. So these were very visible in the in the landscape. If you compare that with the, the chamber tombs, which would which were more simple and cut into the rocks, they were all filled the, the entranceways were usually filled up with earth again, so they would have been invisible apart from the markers that they were placed near the entrances. Yeah, and surprising that these weren't all uh, kind of grave robbed, or, or were they? Well, they were mostly grave robbed. They're, they're yeah. yeah, it's they they've all been looted. They're, I think I think all of them have been looted over the course of time. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, that's one of the problems where you build something that that's highly visible. That you know people are going to be like, hmm, bronze sheath doors and very yeah. impressive masonry. There's probably going to be good stuff in there. 
Well, great. I think that's been a, an awesome overview. Started high level for the Mycenaeans, talked about their major remaining kind of centers, went through the general characteristics, went through the specifics. So this has mm -hmm. been uh, awesome. Is there anything else you wanted to kind of leave us with? Maybe a, a mention of some of the articles over on your site? Uh, no, well, nothing in particular. I'll be writing an article for this uh, video as well to accompany it to go into slightly more detail and give some uh, some references to interesting uh, books on the the subject. Um, and there are some some articles about the Mycenaeans also on the website, also about the the end of the the Bronze Age the, that some people attribute to the Sea Peoples, etc. So there's stuff like that on the website to be found for sure. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, viewers, thank you for tuning in. Check out those links and uh, definitely leave your suggestions for what you'd like to see next. And we can definitely uh, cover that. This one was a suggestion from the fans. And uh, looking at the map of Assassin's Creed, uh, there's a ton more to cover. So, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one with that. Bye bye.